Welcome back to another episode of Good Question by Coin Schedule TV. For this episode of Good Question, I had on James Roy Poulter, CEO at the Reserve and Forbes 30 Under 30. We spoke about a wide variety of subjects, from blockchain's killer application to tokenization and the most promising projects to invest in. It was an interesting conversation. I'm grateful for James for making the time to come on the show. Enjoy. James, thanks very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. No worries at all. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, Anthony. Hey, my pleasure. So the first question is, as always, how did you get into the blockchain and crypto space and why, why do you find it interesting? So actually a funny one. So I'm a chartered accountant by trade. I started my career at Ernst & Young um, many years back, um, but I quit that and started um, kind of teaching myself to code. So I spent two years coding um, when you know my instructors and other people that I were coding with, and I probably committed code in five to seven sort of uh, kind of like uh, early stage tech startups. Um, I came across it then. Uh, I came across Bitcoin back then, probably seven years ago. Oh wow! Did not did not get it. Don't have a great story about buying. You know, even putting ten dollars in back then. Um, yeah, don't have a good story. Um, but I'd heard about it, and it was kind of on my radar. I was then in venture capital um, uh, at a firm called Playfair Capital, where Bitcoin was kind of single digit dollars at this point. Um, we as a fund even looked at taking a placement. Um, and actually the cool thing about the space was that uh, the fund was that we ran this co-investing space called at Warning Guard. And whilst we as a firm didn't get too heavily into kind of crypto, there were some investors which went really hard really early and did very, very well off the back of it. But since basically for five years, I guess I've been following it, you know, uh, like very closely. And the last two and a half years has been full time. Um, and I guess that for me, it's all about the future of economics, politics, uh, governance, power, money, uh, there is literally not a more important industry that you can be working in. Um, it's we're designing systems which are going to run the world. So I, I just, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine sort of being kind of anywhere else. Um, and I sort of actually feel that like the the background I've had is absolutely perfect for for this space and, and what we're doing. So I feel very very fortunate to uh, you know to to be here in this industry. I think it's, it's an absolute privilege to work on the stuff that we get to work on. Um, and I think it's a super interesting. You know, space for the people that are in this industry. I just think it's 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 such an interesting uh, industry. If you're really looking at fundamentally what we're trying to do here as an industry and change in the world, um, yeah, I think it's a it's a real privilege. No, I agree completely. And so you just listed a few things that you think blockchain is going to disrupt. You said politics. You said money. You said economics. A few other things. What is the killer application for blockchain technology in your opinion? Good question. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be one killer, and I guess what do you mean by killer in terms of killer of driving adoption or killer in terms of the disruption that's going to do? I mean, look, I think that um, we're going to move the bedrock of society is based on uh, on on systems which manage resources, people and money. Um, and they tend to be the biggest systems that do those things in these days are our governments. Um, and I think that um, our industry is been very focused historically about um, extracting uh, monetary control from governments and having an independent monetary system. Uh, and I think there's a lot of focus on that and kind of the, the DeFi uh, movement. Um, but I think that actually what we're constantly engaged with and we're much, much less developed with uh, as an ecosystem is governance. Um, and I think actually, I mean, we're, we're building systems which will, you know, which, which will run run the world i mean I, I genuinely believe that i think i think we're building systems which are going to be you know rooted in distributed ledger technology which allows us to trust the data and the uh, the decisions which are being made kind of through these systems but yeah we're in the business of creating unstoppable potentially incorruptible systems which will govern things beyond money and actually if you're if you're building systems which govern money then you know you're already dealing with some of the hardest stuff and the most important stuff that you can govern but i yeah i i, I sort of see you know you know i'm sat here well, I'm a British citizen, and obviously there's a complete farce happening right now uh, with, with, with all that. Uh, but I, think, I imagine all that stuff is going to be happening with this technology behind it all. But I think it's going to be hidden. I don't think people are going to realize that it's um, that this technology is running that. But I think it's that we're in the business of designing systems based on trusted data. And I think the repercussions of that are huge, huge. Yeah, I actually think that's a very good point to bring up Brexit, because I look at the system that we have at the moment, and just just observing it is absolutely absurd. To see the way that these systems have been, these legacy systems have been around for hundreds of years, haven't been automated or updated or digitized in any form. And now the point is that with blockchain technology, we can skip all those incremental improvements in digitization and jump straight to a, you know, a fully decentralized blockchain powered uh, 
governance government model. How far away do you think that is realistically? Essentially, I think like there's technology which already works and can run most of these things that we would you know think about or, or, or talk about. But adoption is a much much bigger challenge. I think there's an interesting dynamic. Like, do we think that we will um, get achieve buy-in from government current governments and you know uh, control systems, and they will adopt this technology, or do we think that we will create um, you know uh, non-sovereign separate systems, which then just take over more roles and responsibilities that government was, and it's done without their choice or involvement? Um, I think both those things are really happening sort of bilaterally uh, and kind of like continuously. Um, but I look, I think the tech could do a lot of what we talk about already. Um, you know, Bitcoin was version one 10 years ago and we're working in far, far superior, superior and advanced systems, which do not have the same limitations and could run and do a lot of things that we talk about, but adoption takes time. And like, I think realistically, you know, we're talking, you know, we're not talking uh, years. We're probably talking, um, you know, a decade uh, to, to two for a lot of these serious changes to happen. But I think that, yeah, I, I think that it will happen faster and the benefits, a lot of this stuff happening are, you know, are incredible um, and will propel it forward. But change takes time, right? Particularly change of the level that we're talking about, um, which is, and, and actually change taking time is not necessarily a bad thing. I think actually if you to bring back Brexit and it's a awful topic in a way, but like, you know, if Brexit's an example of anybody think it's that actually change should be more gradual at times. Um, and the prospect of you voting in an instant for, uh, you know, instant change um, is, um, is, is a bad thing. So I don't think it's bad that it's going to take time um, because these things are super important. And I think it's actually a thing that we don't think about enough as an, as an industry is that like we're building these systems, which are, you know, not even theoretically, like quite literally unstoppable if people want them to continue running. Um, like Bitcoin be, can be drastically uh, inhibited by government action, um, probably more than I think a lot of people kind of realize. Um, but it can't be stopped um, if, we, if people want it to continue. And the challenge I think there is that if we build the right systems um, uh, that are designed correctly, <laughs> um, uh, then it's fine with them being unstoppable. But if you build systems which are, you know, poorly designed or have unintended consequences, um, then I think it can be really challenging for us. And, you know, I don't think we think about the, you know, secondary, tertiary consequences of things that we do release very much as an industry. I think actually, I think our industry, a lot of people are incredibly naive and don't understand why the world works in the way that it does work. Um, and I think that um, there's like a, a brilliance in that kind of naivety and that innocence. Um, but I think it can be dangerous in situations. And I think, again, if you, even if you look at the, we were talking briefly before we started this, right, about the market over the last, you know, 15 months and how it's changed. And, you know, one of the negative things of the market, and I think it's probably the only negative thing, is that there are a bunch of projects which have now run out of money because they completely mismanaged treasury. But that's just a, a general naivety and inexperience. And, you know, it's, 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 I think it's just a symptomatic or representative of a lot of problems in the space where we have people learning lessons that have been learned a hundred times before and people trying to reinvent wheels which have existed for decades as well and it's very generic and very high level but like particularly from the investment perspective like you know it's so naive um, and we've always had the view from the beginning of the reserve to now of like you know this is all just going to change and normalize to how things are done traditionally and i'm no fan of how you know traditional particularly venture capital kind of like works i think there's massive issues with it but it's 10 times better than the ico madness that we had last year which was just a you know a disaster on, on most fronts from my perspective but yeah so so um yes i've I, I talked about a bunch of different things there but um <laughs> yeah no okay i'll focus in on one of the things you mentioned which is the tokenization and these projects that are that took funding in that really probably shouldn't have had funding in the first place. So the problem with that is ICOs and the hype that, that they created and the mass hysteria that that generated. Do you still see utility in the tokenization of projects and the tokenization of everything and ICOs and UTOs and STOs? Is there utility in that and where is that utility? Okay, huge question. Um, so utility is an interesting kind of like word of that, right? Um, in terms of like, I guess like, is there use in doing some of these things? Exactly. Um, and I think if you step back to kind of like the fundamental, I mean, if we're doing like looking at tokenization as a uh, as a thing which can occur to particular assets, 
think um, one of the things I've been trying to, you know, spread thinking on in the industry, you know, this year so far is that if we hang our hats as an industry on the next hype cycle coming from SDOs, then like there's just going to be a, a bear market instantly because SDOs are all going to fail this year. Um, the fact that you can, you know, tokenize something um, does not mean that you should. Um, uh, the fact that you can conduct an STO does not mean that you will raise capital for that successfully. The fact that you can tokenize something and therefore it is theoretically liquid does not mean that it will actually be liquid, right? Like there's huge pieces of work that need to be done in an industry to create, for example, liquidity and secondary markets for assets which you tokenize. Tokenizing them does not do that. Tokenizing them is the easiest 1% of all the work that needs to be done on creating liquidity for particular assets. But I think we should be really comfortable as an industry that actually just being able to tokenize assets is an achievement in and of itself, right? Um, that, um, you know, the fact that we can transfer title or dematerialize shares and put them on these distributed ledgers is um, is an achievement, is a technology achievement, right? The fact that we can transfer title between two parties without the need for an intermediary um, is, is, is exceptional. And the technology that can do that is, you know, from this space and that's incredible. But there's so much extra work that needs to be done kind of on top of that. So look, tokenization is great. It has its place. I do believe in a gradual movement of assets to, you know, distributed ledgers. I believe that, you know, title held on distributed ledgers is a massive improvement to, to real world and can bring all sorts of efficiencies from multiple levels. So I'm pro all of that. I do think that we will gradually tokenize more of the world. Um, I think a large part of the you know, market cap increase that we'll, we're likely to see, and you know, we don't we don't really think, or you know, as a reserve, we don't really think or talk about the you know, the wider market, and we're not traders, and we you know, we're not really concerned about an overall uplift on things. But like, I think like market caps will increase, but the total market cap of the entire industry will increase, but not because of you know, inflation of the assets which are in there, but much more likely because of the increasing incorporation of assets which are outside that space, which already have value coming into that space. Um, but again, yeah. Uh, so I don't know, maybe there's a more specific question within all that, but like I think like tokenization is incredible, has its place, but also has its limitations. And there's like so much work to do above the technology. Uh, and that's another lesson I guess our space is learning that you can build this technology which does things, but then driving adoption and getting real use and, and real value extracted from technology that might be able to do something is like is is, is you know it's very very difficult uh, let's let's put it that way yes the, yeah all fair points and so my question then is obviously this this problem this problem is inhibiting the role of tokenization do you think that the infrastructure level of STOs is currently what's inhibiting it or do you think it's something to do with the general sentiment towards tokenization among uh, like traditional financiers no, I think like I think this is one of the challenges. Like we you know we we meet you know people all the time that would love to tokenize assets. Um, you know there there is there is pent up wealth. Whether it's in you know we we met family offices that want to tokenize from Picassos to diamonds to rare gems to pipelines to skyscrapers to ships to all these things, right? Um, you know the prospect of introducing liquidity to these assets is great, but I think like there's just a naivety in Instead of and, and realizing there's a step on top of that which is required, which is creation of secondary markets. Like I think the technology is there; it works. You can tokenize stuff; it's great. I mean, like we invested in, we're very involved in a project called Dusk, which is going to be at oh, the yeah. heart of a lot of this, um, you know, securitization of tokens, um, also tokenization of securities rather. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, um, uh, but I think actually the securitization of tokens had already happened. Uh, if we were on the joke about like most of these things were securities, but it's, that's another interesting conversation about even how even governments have ignored their own legislation on that but um okay. uh, so, so, so again we were, we were we were again like forgive i'm being cautious about stos but like we were super pro we've always been pro uh, you know stos and the reason we got so involved with dusk is because we are thesis driven and we you know believe that that is where the market was moving and that you can't keep on issuing these instruments that have absolutely no value um by utility tokens um so we got involved in dusk and dusk is a technology layer which Prevectively provides a Ethereum-like platform for everyone to work with securities, um, and has some incredible things in the background, and will be, uh, you know, one of the household name by the end of this year because of the stuff that they've got lined up. Um, so we've always been super pro this, but you have to realise that like having a technology layer that does this is just like step one. And so you, even whether it's a Picasso or a diamond, or you know, or uh, you know, a skyscraper or a new company, whatever, whatever the asset is that you're tokenising, like 
great, you can have a digital register of owners of an asset on a on a on a on a digital ledger, and that's great. Um, but then having if there's unrestricted in transfer rights, then people can you know you and I could meet together and we could transfer an asset between each other, and we can do that without anyone else being involved. It's potentially unlikely depending on the rights and rules attached to a particular security, but if it was structured that way, that could happen. But then it's like actually the challenge of all this stuff is not that um, you know. Is, is how do you find, how do you match buyers and sellers, right? It's it's market making. It's how do you create secondary markets? And I think the challenge is that the secondary market for diamonds is entirely different to the secondary market for 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 you know for expensive cars or whatever it is. And so we need you know, for tokenization to have all these benefits that I think people feel. We need these secondary markets to be created around the particular asset classes, so that there is actually liquidity for these for these things. Um, and you know, I think there's a general belief that you know. Uh, off the top of my head, and I wouldn't be able to point to a fact of this, but like introducing liquidity to an in- liquid asset might increase value by five percent. But I think it's much more likely that we see drops in uh, the value of assets when people realise there is no liquidity and no demand for these things. But the technology is there, and again, our, we as an industry have done that first layer. We just have to. It's going to take time to build up those secondary markets, um, and maybe projects like Dusk can uh, accelerate that in, in situations and actually achieve more than you know uh, than might be expected. But um, yeah, I mean, I think we should be really proud as an industry of what we're, what is possible with this stuff, and it's going to have you know, impacts going forwards. But it's just going to take time for it to permeate through, yeah, you know, through, through through finance, through uh, you know, through society. I want to stick on this um, trail of thought about tokenization for a minute because a lot of people in in articles that write articles with the titles with the effect of ICOs are dead, but STOs are the new thing. I don't actually agree with that sentiment. I think that ICOs, um, I don't think SEOs are going to take away market share from ICOs. I think SEOs going forward will take away market share from conventional finance like VCs, angel, invest- angel investors and IPOs eventually. Do you agree with that sentiment or do you agree with the opposing opinion? Um, so look, I think January, maybe February last year, um, I was on stage a few times and the talk I gave was the ICO is dead. Right. And I think the reasons we gave that were all the reasons it was very clear that there was going to be a market collapse on that. And I think we can say that not with hindsight, but we predicted that in advance and we're on stage publicly talking about that. The talk that I've been giving in January, February this year is the STO is dead. And I've just prefaced that with my feels that actually the future is this stuff, right? But actually, like, it, it is dead. So, like, I'm actually very bearish on it in comparison to, to most people just because I'm realistic and understand what matters in this stuff. But where I think you are, what's right is that it attaches to the point I was saying about we're not going to increase inflate existing assets to achieve a rise in overall uh, market cap. It's going to be the introduction of activity, which is already happening outside, just being title of that being transferred onto distributed ledgers. Mm-hmm. And what you've said there and indicated is just an example of that. Like again, the way the market is raising capital right now is like far, far more traditional. It might just be for a slightly untraditional asset type, uh, like you know, the tokenized equity. Right? I mean, it's it's the if you are tokenizing the equity of a particularly the you know, early stage technology company and trying to raise kind of venture capital. Because again, like, like all the, it, it, like the it's, everything is specific to the asset class. So again, the asset class that we specialize in and understand, right, is technology companies, uh, high growth technology companies from pre-seed with our accelerator, you know, through seed, series A, series B, all the way up to kind of IPO. And again, the, you know, we are in the business of taking companies public, right? You know, I think that's another interesting dynamic here about whether companies should even go public as early as they have been in their journey. But you're right, like all we're doing is potentially seeing like a traditional financing round that happened with traditional venture capitalists um, happening in a tokenized asset. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's liquid. Uh, it mm-hmm. just means that it's on a token and it could be liquid in the future. And it's more easy to make it liquid because the asset is already recorded on a, on a distributed ledger. And then it could be, you know, uh, relinquished and allowed to trade. So I think you're, yeah, again, so my view is that the SGO is not going to be anything like people think it is going to be. It's much more likely that something happens like you're saying there where just traditional financing rounds are then occurring with a digital asset and then some of those there's a subset of that set which will then actually also become liquid instantly and probably more likely that in most financing rounds now are happening and are not liquid like the number of projects which are listing is dramatically fallen um, and i think these are all good things like most projects should not go public at like a you know at a seed series a even series b stage um yeah yeah, well, that's something else that I find interesting for like a very long-term perspective that when a company wants to raise capital, they won't 
necessarily need to go public anymore. They can just launch an STO token and go live on an exchange and use that funds, use those funds to do what would have been done with the funds raised from the IPO eventually. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Like we, we, we spend a lot of time working on this particular topic. Um, and uh, got to be careful. There's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, things I probably can't say. Uh, but um, I think that, um, you know, particularly if you look at the reserve as well, like we, we invest, but we also broker, right? Like with, like with Dusk, we helped them raise capital. And it was our first kind of project that we were, um, you know, doing, of, uh, doing that for, right? And as the, as the market moved from a marketing-driven way that you raise capital, which we had no interest in being involved in, don't believe in stealing money off the public for things that they don't understand. Don't believe in that at all. As we move to a much more traditional way of raising capital, where it's based on relationships and trust built up over time, um, you know, we still think there are incredible management teams in the space all the way across the world. And if there is something true in this space, or something that is actually decentralised in this space, it's the capital and the talent. And so, if you are a project which has been, you know, delivering value and had your head down and not on a city conference circuit messing around, but you've been building value, it's unlikely that you know the investors that are interested in this, right? And now you don't have a two million marketing budget to tell them about it. How do you reach these people? Yeah. And so I think that, you know, we stepped into that kind of like void and had a great success with, with Dusk. We think it's the, you know, to our knowledge and we keep checking and please correct us if you know something wrong, but you know, we, you know, they're, they're 10 million, um, we think is the largest raise for a, project into tokens um in the last kind of five months or so um and uh, and we're now working with another project on that side in a called, called key key foundation it's a uh, effectively you know we talk a lot about these decentralized systems um they're all built on centralized uh, infrastructure uh, whether it's you know aws google ibm microsoft running 75 percent of storage and compute for the internet um uh, but yes, yeah, so, so Key is an incredible project that we've been looking again, and from an investment, a thesis-driven perspective, that we're worried about building these decentralized systems on top of centralized infrastructure. We need to go a level deeper. It's a level harder. It's a level more difficult. But Key is this incredible company which has effectively already got a bunch of contracts in place to run a significant proportion of the internet. Brilliant, brilliant project. It's going to come about more. But like and to bring it back to, to, to the question uh, that you're, you're asking, like, I've tangentially gone somewhere now that I can't remember exactly what you're asking. But um, <laughs> I think that, that I was saying that the market's changed the way that you, how that you raise capital. Um, and you're going to have to draw me back where I was meant to be going with this. What was your question again? Uh, well, I just said that in the future, instead of having the leap from tokenization to IPOs and IPOs being like the ultimate goal, you can have an STO conversion, which is the equivalent at some point in the future. Yeah, exactly. So like, so, <laughs> um, so, I think we, yeah, we do spend a lot of time thinking about this um, and you, you're right. And I guess that the reason I segued into what we do in that regard is that if anything, you know, we're a broker. So when we work with Dusk and we work with Key, we are effectively a broker. Um, and I think that brokers are a very poor word to describe, I guess, like the depth of service that we give um, to all sides of that market. Um, but um, we are at fault uh, in a broker. And I think that we are unbelievably valuable in that role. Uh, and then if you look at like traditional ways that companies go public, um, you have... You know, you, you have two sets of suitors for any incredible asset, right? If you're looking at Uber or you're looking at, you know, uh, TransferWise with those recent news, you know, there are uh, the stock exchanges. So typically, if you're a technology company, you've got the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ and the LSE. Um, if, you're in, if you're in Europe, which are, you know, whining and dining you and hoping that you will choose their, their platform, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got investment bankers on the other side, which are whining and dining you and hoping that you work with them to take you public so they can take their six to eight percent on fees and if you look at like you know some of the big brand name more recent ipos uh snap last year i mean i think there were 16 investment banks that worked on the on the deal and taking it public and so this comes back to your question where it's like you know are we going to just you know better just you know take things public more naturally more easily i think like yes the technology layer will make it simpler for that to happen but like a lot of the work that goes into taking a later stage asset public is more nuanced than just releasing something on a, on a market. And I think like, you know, even with the projects that we've been involved with in, you know, taking them, taking them public in these, uh, in this, in our, in our industry, there's, or at least there's, there's been a lack of nuance in how you do that. And I think that can be damaging for, for value. Um, so I mean, look, the technology layer is going to improve the process of doing things. And I think there's a potential to bring down the costs involved with something dramatically. Um, but it's still ultimately like, you know, you're an asset and, um, 
you need to, to market that asset, you need to sell that asset. And I think there's a reality, like for the different stage of assets, if you are a, if you're an IPO in technology company, um, a, a retail buyer is not your is not your uh, is not the person that's going to move your stock. You know, like if you are a hundred billion dollar market cap or even a ten billion dollar market cap, a couple of million from retail means absolutely nothing, right? Um, and the people that money you are going to is it's, it's you know it's it's wealth managers, it's banks, it's institutional funds, it's professionals which are managing other people's money. Um, and they, you know, relationships of trust built up over time are what matter with those people to make them buy your asset. And how do they even find out about your asset? You know, you can do a direct listing of something. And if you're Spotify, which they did a direct listing and Daniel Elk took them for a direct listing where they didn't actually engage any of these banks. And there's all sorts of risks of doing that. Um, you know, what is price? What is the price support? You know, the, 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 there are really, really good reasons that banks are involved in this, but I think it can be all be improved and the cost of doing this stuff can be reduced and the friction to going public could potentially be reduced. And actually the, you know, if you look at Uber or you look at, you know, the, a lot of these kind of unicorn companies, companies are staying private for, for longer, right? And so there's all these investors, whether they are angel investors or uh, kind of like early funds, which may have you know, maybe holding on to 100, 1,000x returns um, with an inability to liquidate those positions, right? That's crazy. Just, yeah, it's absolutely insane, right? And the challenge of that is the capital is locked in there and those funds could be reinvesting that in the next wave of technology companies, right? So there's potentially all sorts of benefits of, you know, maybe introducing liquidity at different stages to this stuff. But like, it's a lot more nuanced than that. You know, there's like a reason that like normal companies don't want public secondary markets of their stocks you know in their in their growth phases like you know it's 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 um there, there are reasons on both sides of it but uh yeah I, it's there's, there's going to be innovation there's going to be change i think it's going to be more gradual a lot of the exchanges as well so you've got like six um six swiss, swiss stock exchanges in in, in in switzerland which is releasing their digital uh, kind of asset exchange kind of like later this year um you've got the lse with turquoise which is looking at a bunch of stuff uh on this side every exchange in the world is looking at their strategy in this space as well and all assets all share capital all bonds all these things are going to move across but it's just like a technology it's like a back office technology layer improvement to how assets are managed, recorded, and transferred, right? It's like a back office improvement. What happens on the front office of these things, is that really gonna change much because the technology's improved? Like, I think it's much, much, much harder to disrupt some of the reasons mm. things kind of like, you know, happen on, on that side of the things. And I think that's bad. And again, the whole point of this whole conversation is we should be really comfortable as an industry that we've done the first part, which is just like literally improving a back office and saving millions and improving, you know, potentially improving liquidity or improving freedom of assets. It's all incredible things we've done. But yeah, you know, I think we've, we've got to be cautious about just how much we can uh, change. Perfect. And the SEO argument is interesting because it directly infringes on the argument of closed blockchain versus open blockchain. Because obviously these SEO platforms are necessarily closed blockchain because they need all of these compliances and, and all of that. Where do you stand on the open versus closed blockchain argument? Are you pro both? Are you pro closed? Are you pro open? Uh, so look, I'm, I'm pro trust. Um, and, but there's trust of many layers. Um, and so I think it depends on the particular uh, situation um, that um, uh, that you're talking about again the asset and situation so I think that there is there are distributed ledger technologies which can be improved so for example you can have a permission private chain between a hundred banks that work in consortium with each other and introducing a system there will achieve massive benefits uh, amongst those organizations and will introduce trust between those organizations but then if you or I or the public wanted to start interacting with that system, there's just a, you know, there's a, we couldn't trust it to the same level if there was a public permissionless chain, right? And so I think that we, uh, I have a, I, again, so I care about trust. So I want mm -hmm. ideally the most systems to be running on the greatest level of trust. And there's mm -hmm. challenges and efficiencies of doing that at the minute, but the technology is going to continue to improve massively and rapidly over the coming you know years and, and, and decades and so i don't think it's obscene to think that we you know could run every single piece of data uh on a on a dlt if we wanted to uh to introduce sure that we could trust that kind of like more um but um uh, so um, uh, so, 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 so so yes look i'm, I'm basically i'm pro-trust 
And so the more trust we can implement into systems, the better, which means I'm biased on the side of public. Um, when it comes back to kind of the STOs and things, um, I don't think it's like mutually exclusive that you have like a public permissionless chain, which then doesn't have compliance and uh you know embedded in those systems it comes back to again part of the beginning of our conversation about like we can design systems which do different things and we have choices and we can design unstoppable systems which embed compliance in those systems and ensure that we are not facilitating money laundering for example um it may be more nuanced to design systems which do that um but it's possible uh and we have choices as a community as to what kind of like world we want to create and I hope that we choose a responsible world. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we, we've never been and have not and still are not, you know, crypto anarchists um, in, in, in any way. But like, you know, if you look at Key, we're like, we're looking at, you know, the internet on nine layers and, and, and how do we totally decentralize this stuff so it's completely redundant and completely robust and so that no one can shut this stuff down and no one can limit, you know, the human right that it should be to access kind of the internet anywhere in the world. And it's like, that's, I don't know whether that's libertarian or whatever that is, but I don't think we associate with these brands. I think we associate a lot with being really, really practical. And I think that you know, when it goes back to the ICO stuff last year, we totally believe in compliance and regulation. You know, for example, when it comes to selling securities to the public, like 110%. Like, and I think that it's, you know, we can build systems which do different things. I think we really have a choice. And I don't think there's mutual exclusivities between these things. I think there's a really interesting dynamic between privacy and transparency actually talking of potentially mutually exclusive things mm -hmm. um and I, and I feel that's a that's a design problem that we have to try and solve for though again i think it depends on the particular issue that we're talking about but if we could you know create systems which preserve the privacy of individuals and entities and organizations but provide transparency and therefore potentially greater trust in things which matter uh whether that's the the fact that you hold a particular asset and need to prove that to me um uh, and how can we preserve your privacy within that, but also allow you to be transparent so that I can trust something? And um, I think we can. These are just these are these are design problems, and I think that we can we will see solutions to these, and they don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. They seem to now, but um, yeah, I'm pro trust. Um, I'm also pro transparency. I'm also pro uh, personal and entity specific privacy around particular things. Um, but um, yeah, I think we'll build systems which can hold all these things sort of in, in harmony. Fingers crossed, at least. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. And speaking in terms of investment side of things, which part of blockchain do you find most interesting from an investment opportunity perspective? So, like, I mean, like, I think there's a, there's a, there's a high-level point here, which is, like, if you were investing a year ago in this industry, um, all that's happened is innovation has soared, teams have got more serious, um, and valuations have fallen 10x. So if you're investing 12 months ago and you're not investing now, you're an idiot, right? Mm -hmm. Because like it's 10 times cheaper and the teams are better. The, 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 innovate, the, 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 problem with, the problem with like releasing a bunch of assets which do not capture value, these silly, shitty utility tokens, yeah. is that when they fall, the whole world thinks that blockchain's done. Yeah. When actually, you know, I don't know which way people look at this, but it's like, you know, our, we, we go up and then it's gone down. But actually the innovation didn't go up like this. It's been gradually going up. But innovation and the actual value that we're creating as an industry has never been higher. And valuations are down. So it's like this is a brilliant time to be investing, kind of like full stop. And if you look at the reserve and what we are looking for, um, we – we're still looking for these particular assets which have these asymmetric asymmetric return profiles um which are focused on building a more trusted you know decentralized distributed redundant kind of like world um redundant was with the one wrong word there but uh um and so you know we take dusk as an example of that where there's an asset here which we think is massively improving the space and taking the space forwards, um, but also has this very specific return profile where uh, there's a kind of a network effect in the value of the token. Um, and the fact that more people know about Dusk and are trading Dusk genuinely brings that token value. Um, and uh, there's like, a, we do, we have built this like worldwide community of people which really care about the space. And if you have a product, an offering which can leverage that community and that network which has been built up then you have like an opportunity to create much more value in shorter periods of time because of that mm -hmm. and so i think we look as the reserve we look for assets where we feel that 
you know, the relationships that we have um, and the networks that exist in our community um, mean that, you know, these assets can have very significant return profiles in very short periods of time. But it's all focused on trust, all focused on, you know, on, on, on our industry and improving it and pushing it kind of like forwards, but all focused on instruments that truly capture value. Um, truly capture value. Like we're, we're not believers in, um, you know, utility tokens and like disintermediate, oh sorry, and intermediating a process that would have worked without a token um, to, to, to put a to put an extra step into it. That would be an inferior product to someone which doesn't introduce the token, um, and 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 you'll be beaten out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, we think there are exceptional management teams all around the world which are building great technology, which is going to push us forwards. And some of those projects. Um, there is a, an asset, an instrument that makes sense uh, where it can have these insane return profiles. Most don't. Like the vast majority of projects do not. And I think what, a lot of what you see now, particularly in the SDO category, are just like totally normal early stage tech projects which are tokenizing, but it's nothing to do with our industry. You know, nothing to do with our industry really. It's just, it's just they just tokenized a, a media company. We saw like some social media thing the other day. It's just like it's nonsense, and we're not interested in it. Um, not if, if it had been a you know a decentralized version of Facebook, maybe we would. But um, I don't think we have the, the sector expertise on that necessarily. Um, but um, we care about infrastructure still. Like with Key Foundation, this is about we talk a lot as a community about decentralization, but there's still massive points of centralization in in, in the world, and even the existing technology. And building, you know, greater decentralized and more trust into these systems is super important. Um, so yeah, maybe there's a more specific question, but it's like, you know, exceptional management teams which are pushing our industry forwards um, and have these particular assets where there's this potentially asymmetric uh, return profile, such that you can achieve like a normal venture return that might take 10, 15 years in the likes of Uber in, you know, in in two to five years, whatever, these are the assets that we kind of look for and we want to invest into. Um, and we think they're very few and far between. We see a lot of deal flow. Um, you know, the reserves at a team all across the world from the beginning. You know, we have a venture scout network of 25 plus scouts, which bring us deal flow. Like, we see a lot of deals. And I think it's probably only one every two months or so that we feel comfortable and, and feel that fits, you know, kind of like this, 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 uh, this profile. But I think it's interesting as well that our space, you know, the market's moving so much, right? And and kind of even the work that we do changes so rapidly and like, you know, you have to, you know, so the thesis is always evolving. Um, and, uh, you know, we just always, like from our perspective, it's like if you've got exceptional management teams that are building in this space, um, you know, we're always, always interested to, to, hear, to hear from them. Yeah, that's totally fair. My final question to you is, what problems do you see in the space and how could we resolve them? I mean, like, I think, um, it's a big question. I'm sorry about that, but yeah, 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 it is. It is. It is. Um, I mean, I would also go back to something we talked about pre camera, which was, you know, I think there was a big problem last year that was like, just like loads of charlatans running around, um, loads of people giving poor advice, little repercussions. And it's why this bear market has been the best thing which has happened to this industry in the last two years. Um, and actually it's why I want the bear market to continue. Uh, throughout this year, ideally, because I think it keeps the crap away from us. It allows um, the industry to mature um, and for the people that are really here for the long term to keep on, you know, establishing and, and, and for just for more best practice to be kind of like known without just all the kind of crap. So I think there's been a problem that's just been like lots of poor work done by lots of poor people. Um, and so I hope the bear market continues. Um, you know, there is a, there is a, you know, we, we do as an industry, we tend to learn things the hard way. Um, and I think we could learn a lot from the way things work in the real world. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's like, we all hate on all these governments. And I think like Vitalik's also, you know, talked quite often about the fact that he finds it so much easier to get stuff done and to cooperate with governments and with institutions than he does with our community, you know, and we wonder why he has sort of stepped back from some of that community. Was it that he thinks it needs to be decentralized or was he think that it's just a nightmare? Um, and um, so I don't, I don't know. I, I think uh, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, we're in the business of solving problems, right? Like, you know, particularly from a venture perspective, it's like identify a problem, you know, uh, you know, or like an investment thesis that's something that we think should be solved, find the best management team in the world that's solving that problem. So like there are, there are a thousand problems and, you know, like, I'm like, I think like as a, uh, 
know, even like as a firm, right, we also have the, the DLT lab, um, DLT lab world where we're writing checks into pre seed companies, just people. Right. And again, at that point, it really is problem specific. They're typically pre product. Um, and it's like, okay, do we believe that you're an exceptional, you know, one, two, three, four individuals, whatever it is that are sat on top of a problem where you have domain expertise that you can solve. Um, and we do that with DLT lab. So there are hundreds of problems. Um, and I think as an industry, we could just do with continuing to mature um, and um, yeah, and just and keep on being responsible. You know, I think like citizens realizing the repercussions of the work that we're kind of like doing, um, you know, just thinking about those, those for a bit more. Um, yeah. I don't know maybe there's a specific problem in your head that you want uh, an opinion on, but um, I think as a community, we're in the business of solving problems, right. And trying to make the world a better place. At least I hope, at least certainly at the reserve, you know, like we, we are 51% pledged to, to, you know, we don't like using the word charity. Charity is a, a strange word, um, but um, we are fifty-one percent pledged to a trust, which is there to, you know, not make profit for anyone, but to uh, to benefit the world. And we'll be a hundred percent pledged by twenty thirty. So, you know, when we talk about these things, we really genuinely mean them. And I think that everyone in our industry has a choice every day about whether they make our industry better and the world better as well. Um, and I think that. Yeah, if it takes a little bit longer, um, you know, and there is no hype market this year and a whole bunch of people don't get to buy Lamborghinis, like, I do not care. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So less tribalism, more maturity. Yeah, yeah. And just realize, that, like, and, and, some, and humbleness maybe as well. Like, you know, like, there's the, the, the world is not just, you know, like, government is not just all shit, for example. There's so much we can learn about the reason or, the, like, why things occur in the way that they do. And whether it's monetary policy or fiscal policy, like, there's, like, there's all these things that we can learn from how things have happened before. Um, but we should continue experimenting. And we should also continue being ambitious yeah. and, like, realizing that we do have in our hands the capability to create or to, 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 to enact massive change, um, you know, on, on the world. I generally believe that we're all working in the... You know, in, in, in the most important, I mean, beyond us making sure we solve climate change and there's a planet for us to uh, to inhabit in yeah. 50 years. Um, I think that beyond that, um, there's two things which, you know, there's two great problems or things that you should be working on in the world right now. I think that one of those is climate change and two of them is the industry that we're in, in building the future of, you know, of governance and money, economics, power. Um, yeah. Well, no, I actually agree with that completely. Um, that's, a, that's the one... This is where I this is where I sound like a bit of a preacher, and I understand that. But the problem with the systems that we have at the moment is that they're far too entrenched in the way that they've been doing things for a long time now. And the main, the center of the bullseye for the corruption that I see is the financial service sector and central banking, and the fact that there is such central control over money. So for us as a society to be able to tackle these systemic problems like climate change and everything else, we need we need more liquid institutions which are more responsive to the problems of the day and that can only occur once we wean these institutions away from the money supply so that's why i love like the bitcoin movement that's why i love the idea of decentralization of money because it it creates competition for these institutions and there's never been competition for them before so now they have to wake up a little bit and start to tackle these things that they were never going to tackle unless we really you know prodded at them and pushed them to do it and, and I agree, but I think it's just one part of a big puzzle, you know, like, you know, you can move all the world's capital, you know, uh, onto Bitcoin or whatever you want, right? And, and, and move market caps. Um, but um, you still need to deploy that capital in the right way. And that comes back to, to governance and to, it comes back to, you know, we talk about trust, but there's also truth. Truth and trust are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, the, they're overlapping in ways. And, and, and like truth, like there's a big issue still, even if you look at climate change, of the truth around that, right? And there's a significant proportion of the world that doesn't even believe that. And so great, you change the financial system. Okay, you still need to change the decision-making processes around allocation of capital. Mm. Um, you know, when, we, when the, the reserve we talk about, you know, our kind of strap line these days is alliance, execution, and perspective in a decentralized future, right? In a future of trust. But actually where we, when we kind of originally were there, we were talking about um, the reserve was perfecting capital allocation. And I think this comes back to your point, is I think the actual capital is unbelievably poorly deployed. Like unbelievably poorly it's crazy. deployed. Um, it, it, it's so insane, in fact, that it, it, just, it, it just makes me, me go crazy. Um, and I, I think there's so much work to do on that. And so, yes, there's a, there's a step in that in terms of, potentially disrupting money supply 
Um, but I think there's so much more around governance and decision making um, mm. and, and, and decisions on allocation of capital and resource, whether it's human or financial. Um, you know, we're not what well, we are. We are. Some people are tokenizing themselves, but it's like, again, like, can we put all the money on, on, on chain? Well, how about humans? I mean, it's all of us that are going to do these things until AI is running these things autonomously. But AI still needs to connect to the real world. And so we're still going to be responsible for so much of that. And so how do you get This is why it's about governance and, and, and politics mm. and power. And that's actually potentially even more important than the, the money, because again, the, the reason we're even creating, you know, all, look at all the fights and the infighting in Bitcoin, right? It's all about governance, it's people. And so, you know, yes, let's, let's move, let's get more stuff on chain, but then how do we make better decisions uh, that take into um, consideration long-term impacts? How do we price climate change? How do we understand, how do we make it lucrative to redeploy capital into, into solving problems in that, in that, uh, in that space? Um, these are all issues beyond just, um, you know, tokenizing stuff or beyond disrupting uh, finance. We need to disrupt governance and allocation of capital. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. No, I agree. I agree. And the way that I try to explain it to people when it comes to, like, in very layman, simple terms, when it comes to governance on the blockchain, um, I just basically say to people, listen, democracy is merely a consensus mechanism. It's a consensus mechanism for wide populations over time and that through that continued consensus, they can build prosperity and build a society. The problem is that it struggles to scale. It struggles to scale and it degrades over time because of you know human fallibility. But the beauty of the blockchain technology is that when you get that right recipe of, of, um, of like, I don't know, you call it tokenomics, you can call it whatever, whatever the governance structure is, that can scale indefinitely. That can that can scale to global civilizations, like just on the way that the code is structured, and that's a beautiful thing. That's obviously quite utopian, but I basically see that as an inevitability at this point. That someone's going to crack that code. It's going to be open source code. So even if that organization gets taken down, you can copy and paste that into a new one, start it up again, and start to build these communities with continued yeah. consensus. And, but governance is the most important part of all of this because it's we, it's going to be impossible for us to create an infallible system at this moment, right? Like I believe you can create unstoppable and incorruptible systems that can effectively achieve the most utopic version of the future that we could do. And actually, if we could be, if we understood how that algorithm would need to change over time, because the variables will adapt and the situation will adapt, and so we, that will need to change. If we could do that with all the foresight, so that it would automatically change as well over time and evolve, then great, we'd have done it. But I think like what this is why governance is so important because it's like whatever system we introduce, even if it's perfect right now, it will have to change to the changing situation, which is why. And how is it going to change? Through governance. And so it's about like how are we going to, again, agree consensus on how that system should be changed to overall impact the system to the, to the best possible way. It's governance. And I think it's it's a it's an, a lot of the, you know. The, uh, we talk about yeah a lot, a lot like governance is just it, you know it's just it's an absolutely mammoth issue about how do you build networks that are governed in a way such they are uh, able to to change and evolve over time um, and, and this is it's just like this is like Brexit is just this incredible example that's evolving in front of us right now right we have a, a political system in, in the UK that has existed for hundreds of years. Um, and then there's a more recent political integration with the EU has been happening over decades and we're now facing over the matter of, you know, now days and months of a, an abrupt end to, to, to this. It's all about governments, all about governments. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. We get these systems right, you know, they can do amazing things, but it's just like, then how do we keep adapting those systems for the benefit of all as well? I think it's another really challenging point of this. How do we make sure these systems, um, you know, at um, the, the risk of taking, um, you know, a, a labor slogan here, work for the many, a few. Um, like how do we ensure yeah. that it does work for a, for a wider set of populace and a, and a wider community outside of our own, right? Like, yeah. you know, that 20% of the people in the UK don't even have a fucking bank account. Like we talk about getting like, money on chain, just get money in bank. Like, like, like we're so like, this is what I mean, is like a general naivety. Like, like the, we, we, we live in a little castle in the future. And just like the surrounds that so much of the world exists still decades behind where we do as a, as a community. And so like, I think there's like so many problems at so many layers, none of which are simple. Um, but I do believe exactly what you've just said, that we have an opportunity to create systems which can, you know, govern all of this. But governance is a huge uh, Yeah. We can create some method to the madness. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, we will see. Well, we'll see how it all plays out, but I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun.
So cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate the the time and having the you know being able to talk about some of these things. Oh, um, feel free to come back on whenever. <laughs> well, we we can have a catch up at the end of this year and see if the SGO was really dead, uh, or, or or how things really evolved, or what will die in twenty twenty. Is it going to be twenty twenty next year? Twenty twenty next um, year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, no, it's good. Well, I really appreciate the questions. Um, I hope it's used. I'd be interested for people to um, to hear thoughts uh, on this. And again, you can reach out to me uh, at jrp at thereserve dot world yeah. or Twitter, where I read continuously but never really post uh, at James Roy Poulter. And if you are, I mean, the last thing I say, if you are an exceptional management team anywhere in the world. Um, from super pre-seed stage, you know, you should be getting in touch with dltlab.world. Uh, um, if you're later than that, you should be reaching out to us. We'd love to hear from you um, and we try and be constructive in whatever interaction we have, and even if that's not an investment or a bigger engagement for us. So yeah, there's the there's sort of our plug. Um, thank you very much, Anthony, for your time. Thanks for lot, mate. Take care. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and share this video with your friends.